Today's edition of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that I've been lucky enough to be using for a little over a year now. Only rivaled by the impeccable customer service that Kevin and his staff provides, Coach Me Plus's ability to constantly be amoeba-like in their ability to mold and, and matriculate what you're trying to get across and bring together is, is absolutely fantastic. Their constant pursuit of better ways and better methods and, and innovations and progress to their own product is absolutely fantastic. Go over to CoachMePlus.com, check out what they got, guys. It's, uh, it's something that I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the distinct pleasure of sitting down with the director of the Mayo Clinic's Biomechanics Laboratory and Sport Medicine Research Center, Dr. Tim Hewitt. When you're talking with Dr. Hewitt, guys, you're going to be talking about everything that has to do with the ACL. We're going to run through injury mechanisms, his research, what they found, the effects of different playing surfaces, and even some preventative uh, strategies that you could do to help decrease the risk your uh, athletes have of, of these major injuries and keeping them on the field healthy. Really awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Dr. Hewitt, thanks for being on with us today. My pleasure, Jay. Thanks for the invitation. So, obviously, we would be remiss if we didn't get right to the topic of looking at, at the knee, uh, talking with you. So, let's start with... Uh, where you kind of started getting into it, and, and let's go from there. Sure. I started in uh, Cincinnati, and we looked at, uh, this is 25 years ago, we started looking at issues of especially specifically anterior cruciate ligament or ACL injuries and what caused ACL injuries and what were some of the risk factors for ACL injuries. And one of the risk factors we looked at, now remember this is late 80s, early 90s, we started thinking about turf and turf as a risk factor for ACLs. And we actually were working, we were covering um, Soccer World, which is a facility on the north side of Cincinnati in Mason, Ohio. And we had all the athletic trainers and it was a pretty uh, a neat situation because Inside, they had multiple indoor turf fields, and outside, they had grass, equal number of grass fields, and they had these co-ed leagues where they would play indoor and outdoor soccer, and we, the, the thing about injury epidemiology, it's easy to get the numerator. It's easy to get how many injuries happen. The, the hard part is the denominator, how much actual exposure to injury is there. And the unique thing about this study was that they were co-ed leagues and they were an hour long. And so we knew and everybody played the entire time. We had the athletic trainers covering the, the matches. So we knew exactly the denominator, how much exposure each player had. Well, the, the hypothesis we tested in the study was more injuries are going to happen. More ACLs are going to happen on turf than grass. And that's what we tested it. And when we put all the data together, this, this study was actually led by Dr. Tom Lindenfeld, a surgery, a surgeon with that group. When we put all the data together, basically there was no difference at that time. Now remember, this is a different turf than today. Mm-hmm. This is the AstroTurf, which is a pretty slick surface. And there was no difference. But when we started looking at the data more carefully, the thing that really hit us in the face was if you looked at it, what the difference was, was not between turf grass at that time. It was between males and females. And what we showed was that females were 6.2 times more likely to tear their ACL, whether it was on grass or on turf, than males. And again, these were 20-something leagues. It was it was, again, there were equal number, you had to have equal number of males and females on the field at the same time. So it was a really nice comparison. And that was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine back in 1993. So when we looked at that data, we thought, wow, this is, 
this is really unique. And we started looking back at it and we found in a very esoteric journal that the Journal of the Southern Orthopedic Association, a friend of mine now who was then at Duke, he's now a longtime professor and PT at, at Kentucky, Terry Malone, and they did a study in uh, Big Ten and Pac-10 men's and women's basketball. They reported 6.18 times higher, gra greater risk in females. Overalls. And that blew our minds. It was basically this exact same number. And when, you know, when you get the points, when you get a consilience or convergence of that data together, that's when you know something is real. And and that was that was the start of my career into the study of ACL injuries. Now, most of that time over the last 15 plus years, we've been funded by the National Institutes of Health and uh, on the order of more than. $20 million in funding. We were also very generously funded by NFL charities. Now, coming back around to NFL charities, that that story on turf versus grass has now changed because now we have those rubber infill turfs. Yeah. Very, very different story. Those are very sticky surfaces. They're, they're relatively fast surfaces, but they're sticky. There's a lot of shoe to turf friction and hold. So let's talk about how you tear your ACL. The way you tear it is you, you put your foot down, usually with a lot of force, usually a land with really flat foot and the foot sticks down. Now, then what happens next is you make some upper body trunk movement, very rapid turn of your body and your trunk. Now, there's three important points here where the foot is contacting the ground, where your center of mass is and where it's turning, and then the weak link in the chain, your knee. So if your foot is planted on sticky turf and it's not moving and your trunk is turning where you're going to get movement collapses at your knee joint. Mm -hmm. So how does that happen? We've been studying this, as I said, more than 20 years. This is how it happens. If this is your tibia and this is your fibula, that's the bone on the outside of, of, your, of your knee joint. Basically, what you get is this is the tibia going down to the foot. You get a combination of three rotations and luxations. You get this, which is distal tibia abductions. The knee's caving in, as is the hip. Together with that, incidentally, you get anterior translation, especially of this lateral compartment of the tibia relative to the femur, and internal rotation. And when that happens very rapidly, boom, pop, the ACL pops. And I can tell you, there, they, this is controversial. And again, we, there's, we've had a study that's been going on now nine years, funded by the NIH. And what we've used is cadaveric models. We've used in vivo uh, athlete models where we, we actually use inverse dynamics and 3D modeling to measure those motions and moments and torques. And we've also then taken in silico data, computer modeling data from finite element models, other more dynamically driven muscle models and shown that's exactly and all that data comes together. It's like that data that we talked about from 6.2 to 6.18 times higher. It all comes together, well, it, whether it be in vitro and cadavers, in vivo and athletes, or in silico and muscle models. This is how you tear your ACL. So if we're going to get at trying to prevent an ACL injury, this is what we have to prevent. Those three rotations and motions. Now, luckily, we can control that and prevent that. Now, again, there are multiple factors. Let's go back to turf. So the NFL team physicians, which were also funded by NFL charities at that time, they reported this two years ago in American Journal of Sports Medicine. What they showed was on these new rubber infill turfs, your risk of rupturing your ACL is about 64% higher in the NFL on NFL turf fields than on NFL grass fields. 64% is a lot. 
That's a that's a huge number. Now, since that time, actually, only one owner that I know of last field, which is a little scary because a 64 percent difference is relatively huge. When you think in terms of one ACL tear, the potential cost of one ACL tear. I'm from Cincinnati, right? The Bengals quarterback, Andy Dalton, makes the same as uh, as all the high-level quarterbacks. He makes $19 million a year. Do you know how many ACL injuries occurred just in the preseason in the NFL this year? 21 ACL injuries. Now, if you, if you think of that in terms of tens of millions of dollars, that can be a 10 to 20 plus million dollar problem for the NFL in just one preseason. Why wouldn't you ship back? Think of think of the cost of a turf field. The cost of a turf field is about three quarters of a million dollars. The t- cost to convert it back to grass is oh probably about a quarter of a million dollars. So you can take it would cost you a million dollars just in an effort to save one 19 million dollar knee for a season. So ACL injuries are the number one reason for time lost in the NFL. They're also the number one reason for time lost in the NBA. So let's go back coincidental. So we've been tracking NFL data also for over 20 years, NFL injury data. On average, in a regular season, there are about 35 ACL tears in the NFL. We had 21 just in the preseason this year. That is way too many. We have to be moving toward prevention. And I think amongst strength coaches and and coaches in general, there's this idea that, well, an NFL player or even a a football, an American football player is a different animal than than a, a soccer player or what the world calls a football player. I would I would argue against that idea for one reason. Whether you're playing soccer or basketball or American football, 70 to 80 percent of ACL injuries are non-contact injuries. No one takes out the knee. It's just the player's own body movement and muscle recruitment patterns that lead to that injury. That means that those injuries are potentially preventable. Now, most of these studies that we've been conducting, we published the very first study of this in 1999 in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And basically what we said was this, if what we did is we looked at that injury mechanism, this injury mechanism, then we inf- that to, to use a screening protocol to say, which athletes are allowing their they landing in a flat footed position, allowing their hip and knee to collapse in, allowing their knee to internally rotate during sports movements. And we did this study in, in three sports, actually. It was basketball, soccer, and volleyball. And large cohort, over 1,300 individuals. And basically what we showed was neuromuscular training that was targeted toward that injury mechanism and those movements, that inward cave in, that internal rotation, a deduction of the hip and the femur and the inward drop of the knee. When we worked at that by attacking the core, again, three important points. You could, you could actually add the hip in as a fourth point because it's the big, it's one of the big controllers. Here are the controllers, the core and the hip. Here's the symptom, the femur and the knee. Here's the point of contact where the force is coming from, the foot. If you're landing, so if you can prevent, if a strength coach can work with an athlete to prevent any of those three or four points in the chain from occurring, they can significantly reduce the risk. And we showed back in 1999, using neuromuscular training that attacks this mechanism, you can reduce the risk by 62%. Now, one place you're going to attack is the surface, right? So, for example, if you don't land flat-footed, if you land on the ball of your foot, and then you rotate your hip and your trunk, your foot is going to rotate on the ball of the foot, 
not as, as if it's landing where the knee and hip are going to rotate in. So one thing you want to do with training is teach someone to be to, to use their foot as a rocker and a roller. And that's that's great muscle activation, too. And that that's a really cool part about all of this is that all this work, all this neuromuscular training you're going to do to prevent injuries is actually going to enhance performance. It's going to make you a better, more muscle dominant, muscle activated athlete. So let's let's talk about those activation patterns and neuromuscular imbalances that lead an athlete into this high risk position. So, and, and I think some going back to the NFL and the, the, the loss of these players, I think some people have the idea too. Well, so first of all, there's this concept that American football is different than soccer and basketball and volleyball. Again, no, it's not if it's a non-contact injury. It's still the same muscle activation and recruitment patterns that put someone into this point of no return, this point of high load and a potential ACL rupture. But also, I think there's this idea, well, a pro athlete, an NFL athlete or an NBA is the ultimate athlete. So they, they should have very low risk of muscle activation because they're so strong that that they should be at very low risk. Exactly the opposite is true. So what are the risk factors for tearing your ACL? Simple physics. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. The more mass you have, the higher your BMI is, the longer your levers, the longer your bones, that creates greater torque, greater force around the rotating the joint they these players are obviously huge people they're at huge levels of risk but in addition even if they're strong they may be anteriorly loaded they may be asymmetric side to side Mm -hmm. differently loaded they may be top to bottom differently loaded in in all three planes that can lead to greater activation patterns that put them in this position. And you saw that, I don't know if you've seen any of the RG3 videos, when RG3, a great athlete, no doubt, but an asymmetric athlete, when he, in his rookie season, when he tore his ACL graft for the second time, people say, well, you know, how can an athlete with the greatest medical care ACL a second time, but then, if you go back to the data, and this this is all on the web, if you go back to the combine when they were asking him during the NFL combine to, to jump forward into a broad jump and go into a max vertical leap, and these these videos yeah. and pictures are on the web, basically what you see is him collapsing in his internally rotating, collapsing in his hip knee, and going in. Now that way he may have generated power off that that sort of internal torque and then external explosion, but it puts your joints and your ligaments at risk. And I would argue this, skill-specific training, great athletes like RG3 are actually more asymmetric than your average athlete because when you do a skill over and over again, you tend to develop these patterns that allow you to throw a football very far, like a tennis player. They actually, their right arm, if they're right-handed, gets larger. The bone gets thicker. The muscles are stronger. But that's asymmetry that puts you at greater risk of injury. So these pro athletes are at the highest potential. You know, people say, well, oh, you know, girls, adolescent girls collapse their hips and knees. And so do NBA. It's been a huge problem since the lockout in the NBA two and a half years ago. The NBA has lost 14 starting point guards to ACL injury. Do you know what an average starting point guard in the NBA makes? $20 million. So this has been a $280 million problem for the NBA just in the last two years, if you just count starting point guards. Huge problem. But again, Great athletes. These are, without a doubt, some of the very best athletes in the entire world. 
but that doesn't mean they don't have asymmetries and they don't have muscle recruitment patterns that put them at very high risk of injury. They do. In addition, they have all the other risk factors, high BMIs. It's not fat, it's muscle, but it's still high BMIs that generate a lot of force and torque around the joint. So I think it's important that strength coaches consider these asymmetries and neuromuscular imbalances, even in these great athletes. So let's get at those neuromuscular imbalances. What neuromuscular imbalances lead into this mechanism? So over the last 25 years of study, NIH-funded study, what, what we've learned is this, and, and, I'll, and I'll have to say I'm, I'm stretching the evidence a little bit just to make this more didactic. And what I'm going to do is take a whole bunch of evidence from our lab and a bunch of other labs around the world, and I'm going to basically throw it into four different buckets that I'm going to call neuromuscular deficits or neuromuscular imbalances. So, so I'm oversimplifying here, but, you know, I, I think for – for training purposes, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. So the first imbalance that we focus on that we found that's that's very, very clear is athletes at greater risk for an ACL tend to be ligament dominant. Now, what do I mean by ligament dominant? What I mean is instead of being muscle dominant, instead of turning on the musculature, especially posterior chain muscular, uh, musculature, especially core, especially glute complex and hammies, everything posterior chain. The glutes are key. So your glutes are the biggest, strongest muscle in the body, and they are the only three-dimensional controller of the position of both the proximal and the distal femur, and thereby the knee joint. So the glutes are absolutely key. So are the hamstrings. And we can talk about why, but athletes that are more ligament dominant, what they do is they allow, instead of really cranking up and recruiting that posterior chain, and very often it's not a necessarily a strength deficit. Sometimes it's a strength deficit. More often it's a recruitment deficit. They're not recruiting the glutes and the rest of the posterior chain at the level necessary. They may have the strength, but not the and basically what that allows is when you don't activate that glute complex that, complex that is externally rotating your femur when you land, what happens is it allows that internal rotation and cave in of the hip and knee. And what happens is the athlete is then ligament dominant because muscles are designed to absorb and dissipate force. Ligaments are not. So when you're ligament dominant and you allow that force to go to the joint and to the ligament, the ligament has great potential to rupture. So that's the first neuromuscular imbalance that we identified, this, this ligament dominance pattern. The second pattern that puts an athlete at high risk is what we call quad dominance. And we've seen this again and again. We've seen this in our lab. We've seen this in other labs that use totally different experimental paradigms. But what's clear is these athletes tend to be front loaded. So athletes that tend to use their quad to stabilize the knee joint instead of the glute and the hammies, what they do is this. When you contract the quad, the quad does compress the joint together. So they use this pattern in an, an idea to stabilize the joint by compressing it together. But the problem is this, when you use quad and you compress the joint together, what does it do? Well, because of the configuration of the tibia relative to the femur, the medial side of the tibia is actually concave, whereas this is convex on the meat of the femurs. So the femur's convex, it goes out on both sides, it's rounded out. Whereas the medial side of the tibia is rounded in, it's concave. Now the lateral side is also convex. So it's two dome-shaped stu structures, whereas these two fit together, these two don't. So what happens is when you compress it together using the quad like that, what happens? This happens. So the quad-dominant athlete is actually causing abduction, anterior translation, internal rotation. You have to work with a quad dominant athlete. I'm not saying weaken the quads. There, there have been people that have this theory. Oh, you know, this this was occurred at Iowa about 
six, seven years ago, there were a rash of ACL injuries. And the strength coach there did a lot of squatting. And people say, oh, it's because it's they did a lot of squatting. Their quads are so strong. That's not correct for a couple of reasons. Actually, squatting actually activates posterior chain, preferentially over front quad. Mm -hmm. It And it's not bad to have – and I've actually heard physicians say this. Well, the, the athlete's quad was too strong. That's not the essence of quad dominance. You can have your quad as strong as it can possibly be as long as the posterior chain is balanced and activated at a similar, at least the same level. And that, and that's the key to it. Correcting quad dominance is about turning on that posterior chain. Now, the third imbalance we see in these high risk athletes is what we call leg dominance. And that's basically a, a great side to side asymmetry. And we all have that, right? Almost every athlete has some asymmetry The a basketball player Whoever it be, would be, uh, you know, Derek Rose is going to have he, he has his left foot is his favorite takeoff foot. And so in in uh, in soccer, uh, football, people have this favorite foot. So we all have that asymmetry in sports. However, some athletes have significantly greater asymmetries and asymmetries, especially muscular and neuromuscular asymmetries are some of the best predictors of future. And we've shown that repeatedly. There's, there's two asymmetries that really predict injury well. Side to side asymmetries in quad strength, in hammy strength, and relative quad to ham strength, and, and relative quad to ham activation, and side to side differences in those relative quad to ham activation. Those predict risk of injuries like ACLs. So balancing, creating, even in a sport where the sport, the skill training is creating greater asymmetry and greater risk. That's why strength coaches have to work at balancing the athletes side to side. And really, that's just going to make them a better athlete. That's not going to take away that skill that they've ingrained over time. The fourth and really highly important neuromuscular imbalance or neuromuscular deficit we identified was what we call trunk dominance. And what I mean by trunk dominance is the way you observe it is when an athlete is moving, when you put them in a, in a hopping uh, situation in multiple planes, there's too much trunk flopping around. The trunk moves too much. The core doesn't have the core and hip complex don't have enough control. And what happens with that is let's go back to that again. Three important points, your foot, your knee, core. So your core is where your center of mass resides. When you're allowing that center of mass to move around where the force is coming from is the foot. The force vector from the foot from the ground is directed right here at your center of mass. And when you allow it to move around, especially lateral, what happens is the ground reaction force vector goes lateral to the hip and knee and pushes it in. And the greater that distance, a torque is a force. The force is going to be high if they land on a flat foot and they're moving their trunk over. And the farther their trunk is over, the greater the distance. A torque is a force times a distance. The torque goes way up and pushes their hip and knee in. So we have to train athletes to be their core activated, especially with the foot on the ball of the foot, with the hip and knee. If there was one thing I could tell people to train athletes to do to prevent ACL injuries, it's to do single leg hopping type exercises on the ball of the foot with the hip and the knee in a stable neutral configuration with the core musculature in control of that center of mass over the base of the foot. That is key training. And that if you do that kind of training on the ball of the foot, the hip and the knee in a stable configuration, you're going to activate posterior chain. You're going to create, it, it's sort of counterintuitive if you do a lot of hopping single leg work that you're going to create symmetry, but you actually do. 
especially if you give the athlete a lot of feedback on how they're doing relative one side relative to the other, you're going to correct core asymmetry. And if you're in that position, you're going to have to turn on the posterior chain, become less quad dominant and less ligament dominant. That's a lot to take in right there, but that's some awesome stuff. So I think though that the one point that I think we can go back and touch on a little bit more. And I, you don't hear a lot of people talk about this when it comes to the cause and effect model. Athletes are bigger and stronger and moving at a greater rate. Bigger things moving faster are producing more force, which is producing more torque on the joint. Ipso facto, pop goes a weasel. Yes. And there, there's there's no doubt about that. That That's... Any so we do a lot of empirical model modeling. So we actually so what we do is our experimental paradigm. It's a it's a mouthful, but I call it prospective cohort coupled biomechanical epidemiologic studies. Catch that in one uh, one quick breath. <laughs> prospective cohort coupled biomechanical epidemiologic models. What does that mean? What it means is, for example, at Ohio State, last five years I was there, we would bring in the freshman football team every year and we would test them as they came in. And I can tell you, as as Urban Meyer and, and Coach Mick Marathi took over, these athletes kept getting bigger and faster and stronger, you know, all kinds of five star recruits. You would think, wow, awesome, the ath level of the athletes coming up and up, that's going to reduce risk. No, it actually increases risk. It's just simple physics, and it falls out. Of so what we do is we bring in the entire team, bring them in on buses, set up in, in our lab, multiple stations. It depending on the study, anywhere between, say, 8 and 12 stations. So... We have a DEXA scan station, we have a balance station, and we have a 3D sports movement station, and we do an anthropometric station, obviously height, weight, body mass, BMI. We take in all these factors. And then what we do is we take this terabytes and terabytes of data, we store it over on our servers, obviously multiple copies. And, and then what we do over time is track using our athletic trainers, using our strength coaches, using our physicians and physical therapists, track over time exactly who gets injured. What's important, you do this prospectively, because if you look at after the injury, the injury can have effect on all those neuromuscular. And, and here's the important thing, what we're focusing on. Now, we want to focus on all the factors, whether they be anatomic or you name it, anthropometric, but where we're really going to focus on is the modifiable, the adaptable factors that we can change. And so what we do is we find out who has an injury, who has an ACL injury, who goes on to a, a Jones fracture of their foot, who goes on to patellofemoral pain at the knee. And because we captured all this data on these athletes when they were healthy, we have a really nice snapshot of the neuromuscular control deficits, neuromuscular imbalances that put them at risk of that injury. And it always falls out of the models. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. Your longer your tibia is, so that the tibia is what that ground reaction force is using as a lever to mm -hmm. torque your knee joint. The longer your tibia, the greater your risk. We've shown that repeatedly. Body mass. Body mass always falls out. Why? Because it's more force. When you, when that athlete, when that, imagine this. So when you hit the ground, the ground hits you back. Mm -hmm. It's Newton's third law, right? Equal and opposite reaction. Well, it doesn't hit you back with just your body mass. Because your limb segments have inertia, because your center of mass and your body has momentum, you hit the ground and the ground hits you back with multiples of your body mass. So 
for example, I always try to keep myself at 100 kilos. Former powerlifter, I competed at 100, 110, 120 kilos. Now that I'm over 50 and I'm, I'm an old dude, I try to keep myself at 100 kilos, 220. Usually, I'm, I'm usually right at 222. Well, when I'm simply walking across the floor, I'm hitting the ground and the ground is hitting me back. This is just walking. We're not talking playing basketball. When I'm walking, it's hitting me back with two to three times my body mass. So somewhere between four, four, four and six, 66 pounds. Well, you know what it takes to tear an ACL either like this, compressing it together and causing this or pulling it apart. It takes somewhere. We did this test in Cincinnati in the early nineties. We showed that it took 1800 Newtons of force. Well, Pete Brazili and the group in New York City, they repeated our studies and said, no, 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 it takes 2,200 Newtons of force. Even cadavers in New York City are tougher than they are in the Midwest, right? But somewhere, somewhere between 800, uh, 1,800 and 2,200 Newtons of force. So let's do the conversion. How do you convert Newtons to pounds? Well, you have the the factor of acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. So you divide by that. And then once you get that value, then you have to multiply by 2.2 to get to uh, the conversion from metric to uh, over to, to pounds. So what it, the, the force is to multiply by 2.2, divide by 9.8, you end up with a factor of 4.45 repeating. So where you're at is somewhere between 400 and 450 pounds of force to tear your ACL like this or like this. So 400 to 450 pounds. What did I say? As I'm walking across the floor. I'm hitting me and the ground's hitting me back with somewhere between 444 and 660 pounds of force. During walking alone, I'm generating enough force to pop my ACL. The reason I don't is because I'm activating my musculature to absorb and dissipate force. Now, what happens with a ligament dominant athlete who's not properly activating posterior chain to absorb and, and, and dissipate this force? Well, when they're landing from a basketball rebound or in a move on a football field, they're hitting the ground and the ground is hitting them back somewhere between say four and 12 full body mass. A gymnast, for example, a gymnast going off of the pommel horse and landing beautifully, gracefully straight legged is hitting the ground with in excess of 20 times body mass. So an athlete playing football, basketball is usually in the range of somewhere between four and 10 times body mass. So multiples of what it requires to tear their ACL. Your ACL is this big. It's proportional to the size of your pinky. The PCL is this big. It's proportional to the size of your thumb. And the reason they're called the, the cruciate, the reason it's anterior cruciate, the anterior is, is inserts, the origin is posterior and anterior on the tibia. That's why it's called anterior. The reason they're called cruciate is they cross one another. And where they cross one another in the sagittal plane, that's the center of the hinge of the knee joint, which changes as you flex, extend, rotate your knee, which, by the way, doesn't just flex and extend. It moves in all three planes all the time. It flexes, it extends, it ABA, deducts, it internally, externally rotates. Now, again, you allow the ground reaction force to dictate where that's going to go, or you're not using your core and hip musculature to control the position of your femur relative to your tibia, you're going to get in trouble. You're a ligament dominant athlete. What strength coaches need to do is teach them to be a muscle dominant athlete. And they've, they've got the strength, enhanced strength, but focus on those recruitment patterns during high risk movements, because there's enough force there at all times, especially in these enormous athletes today that to, to tear their ACL, something Teddy Bridgewater did a couple weeks ago, all he did is go back and plant to throw a pass and he dislocated his knee. Mm -hmm. Now, usually to dislocate your knee, it takes the force of an automobile crash or, or falling off a motorcycle to, to generate that kind of active force. 
However, in someone who's really obese, they can do it just like stepping down wrong off a curb. Why? Force, massive forces acting at that point. And, and this is, abs- I think a lot of people don't realize that. It, it seems simple, and I know it sounds like a nursery rhyme, but the bigger you are, the harder you fall is a real more force. These big athletes, strength coaches are working with these days, are at greater risk. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. So while you're making them bigger and stronger and faster, make sure you're working a lot of different hopping patterns and moving forward. Um, and Hop, which- Posterior chain, glutes. I mean, really focus on, on recruitment. Uh, it, it's Posterior core, hip, posterior chain, hammies are absolutely crucial. And working them in a functional foot-based environment is is crucial. Sure, get them strong, but get them strong in all planes, reacting, keeping this from happening at the same time. You don't want that hip caving in, knee caving in, foot flat on the ground, knee rotating inward at the same time rapidly with a lot of force. If that happens, your risk of tearing this little guy incredibly strong, it takes 400 to 450 pounds of force to pull this guy or compress him apart. So very high, what, what's called modulus of elasticity, a very elastic, very strong structure. But again, in sports, you're going to be hitting that with multiples if you don't Use your posterior chain, the hip musculature, the core in a functional position with your hip and knee in neutral on the bottom of your foot with the center of mass under control over the plantar surface of the foot. As soon as you start going out of that pattern and under recruiting, you're in, you're in a problem position. Yeah, and I think that's an awesome spot to leave it. So we've gone through the lead up to finding all this information, what the, what the research and, and everything is telling us about how it happens, why it happens, the history of it when it comes to developing athletes, and what we can do as coaches to maybe not prevent all of them, but hopefully put our athletes in a better position to you know, knock wood, walk away a, safe and sound after each competition. So that's that. So that's the goal. And my colleagues, Greg Meyer at Cincinnati Children's and Dai Sugimoto now at Harvard, we redid the data and basically showed now there are 14 randomized controlled trials. What we showed was a relative risk reduction using this neuromuscular training of ACLs by 62 percent. The exact value again in 1999 in the first study that we did. So again, a consilience, a convergence of the data that clearly shows this type of neuromuscular training targeted at these four neuromuscular deficits significantly reduce risk by somewhere between one and a half and two thirds. Yeah, that's, that's unbelievable. So Dr. Hewitt, since people are going to want to know more about this, where can they keep up with you? They can find me out on the web. I'm at uh, hewitt.timothy at mayo.edu. And uh, if they go to the Mayo Clinic Sports Medicine website or the Biomechanics Labs website, the director of uh, research in, in both places, just Google me. I'm, I'm relatively easy to find. And then put a lot of really good stuff out on Twitter, too. So if you don't follow him, it's Tim underscore Hewitt. No, it's it's Tim. It's Hewitt One Tim yes, on Hewitt Twitter. One Tim. Yeah, that's right. Hewitt yep. One Tim. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. You're more than welcome, Jay. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. We'll be in touch real soon. Sounds great. Bye now. See ya. And a huge thanks to Dr. Hewitt for spending the time with us talking ACLs today, guys. Just you know, you're learning from the man right there. Dr. Hewitt is one of, if not the source when it comes to everything and anything ACL injury. So for him to spend the time and share his knowledge with us is is really super awesome. I hope you guys can take something from it. And if so, if you enjoyed it, just like every other one of the things we put out, guys, please share it in the social media album of your choice. We're just trying to get the best information out there that we can, 
trying to drive conversation. So if you did enjoy the talk, please share it. We appreciate everything you guys do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance, and we will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.